Uh, you know, about four or five years ago, I used to own and run a design studio in Chicago. We did a lot of experimental design, and the awards community, the site, the people, it was a huge, huge inspiration for us uh, back at that time. It was super important for our growth and just finding our way as a company. And so I have so much respect for everybody here in the audience because I know that you guys are the ones that are constantly trying to push the envelope and constantly trying to reimagine you know, how we experience our digital content. So thank you again for having me. Now, I have a 45-minute talk that I only have 25 minutes to give because that's all the time they gave me. So I'm going to try to do this really fast, and I hope you enjoy it. So here we go. Design for Pattern. Uh, so I'm Eric Klimczak, um, principal designer at Uber. Some people ask about the principal role. Um, what do principals do? It's a hands-on role, so it, it's not a management role. And we typically work across the entire portfolio of products. Um, but I, I typically work with uh, R&D groups and policy groups on sort of a two to four year out horizon. Uh, and as we watch technical uh, trends and social trends and cultural trends, we want to kind of understand how Uber's uh, going to fit into the world as it changes. And so uh, that's mostly uh, what I do at Uber. And uh, you'll see some of that thinking reflected in the talk. So before I get into it, I'm going to take a spin through some of the things that we do at Uber. If you follow along, uh, in the news, you probably only see kind of a sliver of, of what we actually do. So here's the full portfolio uh, as of now. Obviously, everyone knows uh, the Rider app. This is our most public thing. We hit something like 15 billion rides recently, which scares the shit out of me, and I'll tell you why in a little while. Um, but we have a little over 100 million users. We're going public tomorrow. So you know, hopefully this talk helps that, that number go up even higher. Uh, or it's going to be like the worst day of my life. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, to make all those rides happen, uh, obviously we have uh, millions of drivers uh, to make those possible. Now, cool thing about this app is we uh, spent about a year and a half rolling this out to a completely redesigned app. We worked very closely with our drivers to kind of build together to make that happen, really rewarding experience. Um, well, we, we figured if we could move people, we can probably move pizzas. And I'm glad that we did, because this is one of the fastest growing businesses, entities within Uber. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe in the world. It's, it's like less than five years old. It's already in the billions. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, we have freight, and that's relatively new for us. It's classic Uber. It's you know an old, stodgy industry, a lot of handshake deals, paper and pen. Uh, and so we really focus on the driver and uh, kind of optimize for them rather than the distribution centers and things like that. So uh, lots to, to do in that space. Uh, if you live here in S San Francisco, you're probably seeing our self-driving cars. Uh, I worked in this group for about a year and a half. Um, if you want to grab beers after the conference and talk, I got, I got stories. Uh, so we're also looking up into the sky uh, with a program called Uber Elevate. This is a little bit for forward thinking, a little bit farther out. Um, but it's all around um, what some people call flying cars. And, and really, they're, they're technically called VTOLs, which are vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts. It's, pretty, it's, it's very nascent today. Um, but some of the cool work we get to do is work like with NASA to figure out the air traffic control systems and stuff like that, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and then our most recent investments have been around what we call new mobility, which is, for now, uh, bikes and scooters, but it's uh, uh, really inclusive of all kinds of different uh, alternative transportation modes. You've probably seen these around San Francisco. They're, they're pretty awesome. You know, Uber started out with a, a very simple premise. It was push a button, get a ride, and it went way farther than any of us could have ever imagined. We applied that infrastructure to all other kinds of uh, services and businesses. And you know, fast forward almost 10 years later, and we've amassed this enormous global business. And it's been really successful, but it's also come with some consequences. On one hand, 
we've done a lot of good in the world, and it was kind of by accident. And on the other hand, there's been some not so good, some unintended consequences, if you will. And it was about a year and a half ago that we started thinking to ourselves, well, what if we did all this good on purpose? How would that change the way we think about product? And what would that mean for us as designers? And, and really, it meant sort of a radical shift from thinking of ourselves as screen designers to impact designers. Which brings me to design for pattern. This is a conceptual model for how we think about design and product design at Uber. If you're thinking design patterns, UI patterns, that's one kind of pattern. That's unfortunately not what I'm going to talk about today. So sorry to disappoint if that's what you were thinking this one was going to be about. But hopefully you'll like it anyway. I'm going to go a little academic for a moment, and then it'll get pretty anecdotal, I promise. So design for pattern. It's all about understanding an object's context. To design an object very well, design a product very well, you need to understand its context. Sometimes we call that different resolutions. And at any given resolution, you're going to have forces that influence that product. In Uber's case, social influences, economic influences, environmental influences, these are the things that sort of shape our product. I like to use this example to kind of illustrate this idea of zooming in and out. This is a, an old Ames video. Uh, if you've, you probably remember this in design school, uh, it's pretty uh, classic. And so if we get a little bit more practical for a minute, let's say you have an app. And at the lowest resolution, you have screen. And it's got features. And the influences that are going to act on that screen are going to be things like business metrics, user goals, uh, business goals, things like that. And if we move up to, say, the middle resolution or the city level, well, now you have things like legal restrictions, policy mandates, government mandates. And those are going to change the way you, you design your products. And if you go all the way up to the systemic level, well, now you're thinking about cultural norms and social norms and how that's going to in, inform your product. And it's by understanding this very broad landscape of where your product exists that you can design a product well, but more importantly, sort of avoid these unintended consequences that typically come up when we're only focused on a sliver. This is particularly important for Uber because we have, and, and really any company, that has a strong connection between the physical and digital. So we build these pretty massive virtual software systems that have substantial real-world impact. When we make changes in our software, it can have dramatic impact in the real world. And that's why that, those 15 <laughs> million rides scare the shit out of me, because you can really mess things up if, you don't, if you're not careful. And, and I think we have in a couple instances. So uh, you know, that's, that's why understanding these contexts are so important. And if I take a step back for a minute and talk about some of where we got our inspiration from, um, our boss. Uh, he came in as a VP of design. He, he's, he's, he's an older gentleman. And uh, he had this white paper that uh, he brought along with from this man named Wendell Berry. Wendell was a philosopher, a writer, and he had a farm. And periodically, he'd write about this farm. And about 35 years ago, he wrote this white paper uh, of some observations he saw on the farm. And what he was talking about was uh, sustainable farming. But 35 years ago, I don't think we called it that. And he would say things like, well, if you have a bug problem and you kill the bugs, but then the pesticides used to kill the bugs kill the plants, and the livestock have no plants to eat, well, then your problems go much further than the original bug problem that you had. And he talked about this in terms of patterns within patterns. And if you optimize for sort of a local output, you can do that at the detriment of the bigger system. And when we read this, or at least when I read it, I thought to myself, wow, this is so similar to like, the, the mental model of how we need to be thinking about design at Uber. And so it's led us to start thinking about uh, a methodology for designing for pattern at different scales or different resolutions. And you might be thinking, well, Eric, isn't this just service design? And the answer is yes. But <laughs> uh, well, if you're a service designer, maybe we should talk after uh, and, and talk about working at Uber, because we need more of those folks. Um, but you know, if you're like me, uh, I come from uh, a different background. right? I come from a, more of an agency background, uh, motion graphics, advertising. And so uh, at least 
before I joined Uber, I was very focused on a, a small sliver of that bigger uh, set of resolutions. And so I think that's when we get into trouble, right? When we're optimizing for ourselves on that local level, we ignore those bigger, those bigger pictures, and that's when these unintended consequences sort of creep up. Okay, so that was sort of the academic side of the talk. And now I'm going to get into more of this anecdotal side, uh, some places I think we're having impact uh, at Uber. And I'm going to tell you three stories. The first one is social, the second one is economic, third one is environmental. They're all united by this common theme of mobility. And, you know, Uber, people, cars, driving, mobility, that kind of makes sense. That's not exactly the kind of mobility I'm going to be talking about, but I think you'll, you'll find some of the results surprising. So to start with social mobility, uh, I'm going to talk about boundaries. And boundaries create isolation. And boundaries can be formed through things like geography, through communication, through language. And in this case, uh, communication, we have um, pretty harsh effects. So the deaf community in the United States has a 70% unemployment rate. And you wonder, well, what can a company like Uber do? And so we took our app and we extended it uh, to include a few features like that screen flashing and some messaging to enable uh, this community to, to find work on the platform. This is one of my favorite examples because when we talk about the impact and those different resolutions, well, this low resolution of changing screen elements enabled an entire population's uh, ability to earn and uh, earn on the platform. And, and I love that one. We thought to ourselves, well, um, okay, we made a pretty big dent in this unemployment problem and we saw some critical mass there. What else can we do? So we introduced this feature to break down another barrier, which is the rider-driver barrier. And we thought, well, what if we could teach riders some basic sign language so they could communicate with the drivers? And this was a campaign that we ran for some time, and we taught uh, riders how to say things like, good morning, hello, my name is, et cetera. I think mostly everyone messed up the signing, and it was more hilarious for the drivers, but they appreciated it. Um, and so it's, you know, we're now inching up this, uh, this set of scales here, and you know, if we take it at the highest level, Uber does 15 million rides every single day, which nets out to billions, and when I heard this stat, I was amazed, billions of minutes of conversation in Ubers every year. That's multiple centuries worth of conversations happening in the back seats of Uber every single year across the world. And you think about our app now being this incredible conversation starter between very diverse social backgrounds, very diverse economic backgrounds. And I don't feel that we've even begun to tap into the power of these connections. Uh, definitely a place I'm very excited to be uh, focusing my energy as time goes on. Um, so that was the first story. Next story is economic mobility. So with this story, I'm going to start with this image here. It kind of looks like a piece of art. I wish it was. Unfortunately, these are called SUS, or sensitive urban zones, and they're found in Paris, France. They're typically characterized by high rates of crime and unemployment. And I've been at Uber for a little while now, and one of the stats that I've heard that like, absolutely uh, floored me was this idea that your distance away from a transportation hub is one of the strongest indicators of whether or not you can pull yourself out of poverty. So if you're um, below the poverty line and you don't have a lot of access to work, it's not education that's going to help you sort of get that first rung in the ladder. It's actually uh, your distance to a transportation hub. So if we overlay the Paris metro lines uh, and look at how uh, the, they map up to uh, these red spots, you can see that there's some gaps. And the Paris metro lines are probably some of the best in the world, but we still have some gaps there. The obvious thing to do here is to overlay uh, Uber's network to show how we can extend that public transport, which um, I'm pretty proud of. We can help people get to those transportation hubs. We can help people get those rides. It's not the, the most interesting part, though. I think the most interesting part is if we filter this data set by the registrations of drivers that are coming out of those areas, well, we're giving them the job. We're giving them that first uh, rung in the economic ladder, if you will, uh, that they might not have anywhere else. So we're trying to lift those red spots up altogether. But giving someone a job, really, this is only you know, the first resolution. If you, if you pop up to the next level, I think we need to talk about work in general. 
And over the last, I don't know, three, four decades, we've really established this uh, linear model of work where you go to school, you incur tons of debt, you become very specialized, you get your first job, you work really, really hard, hopefully you keep getting promoted, and if you don't mess up, don't make any mistakes, maybe you get all the way to the executive level. And by that time, you retire, you get your gold watch, you buy a boat, and then you die. <laughs> because you've worked so hard, right? Uh, and your family probably hates you too. But, uh, so we know that this type of work is not for everybody, right? And it's absolutely inflexible in the sense that if you need to explore a career change or if you want to have kids, well, you know, you may never reach uh, certain levels of success. So gig work, obviously what Uber is in the business of, and other companies like Uber, um, it's starting to challenge this notion of what work is and what and how we even call work. And we know that flexibility is a big part of that. And you think flexibility, yeah, OK, I can go and work whenever I want. That's part of the benefit. But living with flexibility this is an entirely different thing. Being able to provide and earn while exploring different education opportunities, that's living with flexibility. Being able to have kids and still have a successful career and grow as a professional, that's living with flexibility. And that's what I think is sort of the key to leading kind of an enriched life. So let's look at somebody that's doing this right now. Uno, I'm an Uber driver. Dos, I'm a chicken farmer. Tres, mechanic and paint shop. Cuatro, I'm a pig farmer. Cinco, I'm a flight attendant. Seis, auxiliary police officer. The moves for me are how can I acquire time? You can have all the money, all the materialistic things in the world. Don't mean anything if you don't have time. So this is Domingo. He's one of our favorite Uber drivers. He's, he's got seven gigs in addition to his Uber job. And one of my favorite things, it wasn't said here, um, is he uses Uber as sort of like a paid way to go to his job at, on the airline. And then he uses the airline flights as free business travel to go visit his farms. So he, he absolutely like optimizes his schedule in a way that, that all of us could, could benefit from. And when you think about guys like Domingo, and he's got you know, seven, eight jobs, and is it that weird to think that, well, maybe if this trend keeps going, could people have 50 jobs in a lifetime? And now you're all probably recoiling a little bit, like, ooh, that doesn't sound very good. And it's intentionally provocative because you know, this is part of thinking responsibly about these unintended consequences. This is a possibility, right? If seven jobs is starting to come up now, I don't think it's crazy to think well, people might have 50 jobs in a lifetime. And so it's our job to figure out, well, how do we change that from 50 jobs in a lifetime to 50 opportunities for growth? Uh, and to do that, I think you need to call into question you know, the very nature of work. You need to probably redefine work, at least in the eyes of the government. Um, and this might sound a little technical, but if you're the government, you think you, uh, there's full-time work and there's contract work. If you're a full-time employee sitting at a desk for eight hours a day, you get all the benefits uh, in the world and retirement plans and all these things. And if you're uh, a contractor and you sit eight hours in a car working for Uber, you get nothing. And so there's all this gray uh, area in between, we think, uh, opportunity to kind of redefine uh, how benefits and how insurance and everything works. And so if you fundamentally redefine work in the eyes of the government, you got to ask yourself, well, what else would change? Could we actually make work more accessible, break down barriers for everyone? Would, would it actually fundamentally change what we call work today? These are the kind of questions we, we you know, kick around. I don't think we have all the answers to yet, but certainly um, a really, really big and exciting part of uh, where we're going. OK, the last story. The environmental mobility. So this one starts with an unintended consequence. So if you live here in San Francisco, uh, you probably see a lot of people taking Ubers or Lyfts. And uh, well, there's more cars on the road. And when you have more cars on the road, there's more congestion. There's more CO2 emission. And trust me, none of us joined Uber because we want to pollute the world. That's definitely not why we take these jobs. Uh, but it's causing us now to think about our products in a much broader way. This is a pretty well-documented stat. 
It says that 68% of the world's population will uh, live in cities by 2050. So over the next 30 years, there will be a 300% mobility demand in our cities. Could you imagine San Francisco with 300% more mobility demand or traffic or whatever you want to call it? I can't. We don't, I don't think we'd actually move anywhere. So let's look at a typical city. You know, we have cars in traffic. We have not a lot of room for bikers, pretty, pretty dangerous. We have these red cars, which are parked, clogging up a lot of space. And the red lined area is kind of the space left for humans. And so we can pretty safely say our cities, our modern day cities, have been designed around cars, not people. And there's a lot of um, urban mobility kind of topics kicking around right now, a lot of people participating in uh, the conversation of how do we recenter our cities for humans. And I actually think this is just as much a design problem as anything else. And one of the things that comes up a lot is autonomous and self-driving cars. And we've all heard the promises. I've drank this Kool-Aid where, you know, we have these cars and they're super advanced. They're going to melt away congestion and they're going to uh, be infinitely safer. So let's pop a self-driving car into the mix and see what happens. Nothing. That's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of an unfair thing to, to say. Uh, I think something would happen. But to be illustrative, uh, it's not just this car and the technology in it that's going to make these changes. That one thing by itself is not going to have the benefits that we might think it has. It's how all of these things come together that's really going to make the change. So if we look at the city from a different perspective, I know that was kind of cheesy. Uh, <laughs> let's start with something like the curb and the cars. So if we, if we remove the curb and the parked cars, well, we can gain a lot more space. And that can be space, mixed use space for people. Uh, and we can widen our streets for alternative uh, transportation modes. And now the space that we have left for cars, I think we should be a little bit more rigorous about what kind of cars actually go there. And so uh, this was what we would probably call a kind of high density area where these little micro mobility scooters and bikes and uh, things like that would make a lot of sense for efficiency. But you can't really look at uh, the city just at one slice there. You kind of got to go out a little bit further. And so uh, you know, this is the, the very inner part of the city. If we move out towards the arterials, well, here we have uh, wider streets that can hold more people, so more bigger vehicles make sense. And if we move out to the highways, this may be one of the areas we see uh, the biggest benefits for autonomy, because now we have a lot of cars, highly coordinated, moving very quickly. Um, automation really plays a role at all of these levels, but it's this kind of diverse approach to transportation that I think is going to unlock, uh, unlock the cities. So the holy grail here is you, know, you one day are able to ride your bike and your self-driving car is waiting perfectly for you. It whisks you off to your VTOL that takes you 300 miles away to a meeting, and then you're back home uh, that night for dinner. And it may fundamentally change you know, how we work, where we work, uh, and everything about our lives. But we know that this is not possible today, mostly because we don't have the data. And this is going to get a little out there and a little scary, but let's pretend that our bikes talk to our cars, and our cars talk to the subway, and the subways talk to the traffic systems, and the planes talk to the cities, and the cities talk to each other. We'd have this massively connected transportation network. And that's one step, I think, towards making a dent in this mobility demand that we're going to see over time. But of course, in the spirit of designing for pattern, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the consequences of this? And I don't know yet. I'm not ready to answer those questions. But uh, I told you three stories of uh, how um, designing at different scales is important and can have really good impacts. It can have uh, some not so good impacts. And uh, as a result of things like this, not just these three, but lots of things like this at Uber, we're starting to derive a set of principles that we try to think of all of our products uh, through the lens of. So I'm going to spin through these really quick because I'm running out of time. But the idea here is I have four principles. The first one is good design is focused. It stops at just enough. Now, it might be the, the most cliche thing I could possibly say at a design conference that you should be simple. But it's really that second part there. It stops at just enough. 
We're all super smart designers and engineers. We work with super smart people. We love hard problems. We love hard problems so much that even when the problems are simple, we want to make them super hard. And so that's why we have so much bloatware out there. So like, just, you know, it's okay. Just, just enough's okay. So the second one, design, uh, good design respects limits. Limits are everywhere. Technological, team limits, talent limits. Um, but the, the, the idea here is that we've all had these harebrained ideas, you know, and we think, oh, no one's ever thought of this. And there may be a reason why no one's ever thought of it. That's not to say that good ideas don't come from time to time and they're very innovative, but if you're kind of uh, getting off the reservoir, you should trust it a little bit less. You should put a little bit more rigor around the ideas that are not so familiar. The next one, if there's one slide that I think really captures this idea of design for pattern, it's this uh, good design solves more than one problem, doesn't make new problems. This really gets back to the Wendell Berry farm example where when you're solving your problem, try to think of it uh, very holistically. And lastly, maybe the most esoteric one, good design preserves the integrity of the pattern that contains it. This is a, a call for coherence. So if we think of those resolutions and you're solving problems at different resolutions, well, you want some kind of through line that, that makes it feel like one thing and not disparate solutions. So to close, um, you know, I'll just say that in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen this explosion of digital innovation come into our lives. And just now, we're starting to experience some of the, the unintended consequences. Even our beloved iPhones right, are hijacking our kids' attention spans. Uber, Twitter, Facebook, we've all had our moments, right? And I think we can learn from these moments. So I would ask you all to, you know, let's be responsible when we're, when we're doing our designs. And instead of creating stuff and putting it out there and see what happens, let's do some good on purpose. Thank you.